I have seen the disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya 12 times in the last two years. That is one day, eight hours, 21 minutes, and 24 seconds of my life that I'll never get back. Yeah, I, I know, I'm nuts, but I can't help myself. Every time I get the urge to watch a scene from this film, I end up watching the whole thing from start to finish. You see, this isn't just a special movie for me. Out of the dozens, no, hundreds of brilliant artistic works I've experienced throughout my life, Tower achievements that showcase just how special human creativity is, there are none that I respect more than this film. <sighs> Dang it. There I go making lofty statements again. Now people are going to expect a good explanation for why I feel this way. They're probably hoping for some grand story about how I learned to love an entire medium through this film. Maybe they even want me to go through the whole thing from start to finish, analyzing every aspect of it to satisfy their ravenous thirst for content. No anything but that. They know how long I give myself to make these things, right? Yeah, yeah. It's going to be fine. I, uh, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, I, I think that might have been an over-exaggeration. Sure, I love the film, but no way in hell am I ever going to say that, you know... This is the most well-written, technically impressive, and emotionally impactful film I've ever seen. Oh my god, just lie! That's all you had to do! And you know what? I'm not leaving any stones unturned. I originally intended this to be a standard movie is good throwaway video before I plunge headfirst into a massive project I've been planning for months. And it was going to be especially easy since I've already covered this movie before. But then I watched it again, and after reminding myself why I've spent so many hours of my life entranced by it, I can't just walk away from an opportunity to be as thorough as possible with it. I haven't even planned out the rest of this video as I'm writing this. I don't know how long it's going to be, and I don't care. All I care about right now is taking you on a journey to some unnamed Japanese town on December 18th, whatever year this movie takes place in. How vague can one person be? Who told me that was a good stinger to transition into the meat of the video with? I know damn well how much information information is classified in this series, yet still I chose to- oh, the, the title card. Crap, I, I think it's my turn to talk again. <clears throat> Our story begins as innocently as one can. The first 20 minutes of disappearance are seemingly indistinguishable from a regular episode of the show, immediately laying the groundwork for what I believe to be the film's most amazing quality. It's a normal day for the SOS Brigade. They go to school, greet each other, have some charming interactions, all while Kion delivers one of his signature models monologues fill to the brim with snark and cynicism. As always though, any pleasant thoughts he may be having are quickly beaten out of him the second Haruhi Suzumiya bursts through the clubroom door. Kept you waiting, didn't I? Kept you waiting, huh? Business as usual, right? Well, not quite. You might notice that Haruhi Land has received a gorgeous upgrade to its aesthetics since the last time we saw it. It's not just the extra details, more fluid animation, improved cinematography and lighting. There's a warmth to this film's art direction that very few are able to replicate. Despite the fact that it takes place during winter and that the tone is rather gloomy, it always looks so inviting and comforting. It catches your eyes, nurtures them, feeds them, takes them to soccer practice, tucks them into bed at night, and and wakes you up the next morning to do it all again. It grabs your attention and holds it until its enormous runtime is finished. I'd have a better time writing a good metaphor if I asked a grade schooler to do it. Another thing that differs from a typical episode is its commitment to planting seeds for the rest of the film. You've got Taniguchi mentioning his plans for a date on Christmas Eve with a girl from Koyoin Academy, Koizumi talking to Kion about how Nagato has subtly changed over time, Kion's monologue about Haruhi being quote the root of all evil in the universe. This easygoing opening is naturally injecting important information into its script without raising suspicions from the audience, but every film has to get to the point eventually, so let's all say goodbye to happy Haruhi Funtime Land and say hello to shitty despair I want to go home land. Immediately something seems off. Kion isn't dragged off his bed along with his blankets like yesterday, the colors are looking a tad more washed out, Taniguchi has a terrible cold despite being fine yesterday and has no idea what 
Kion is talking about when he brings up his date or the SOS Brigade party. However, Kion just writes that last one off as him coping from being dumped. It's also worth mentioning that today is National Let's Learn in the Dark Day, creating an atmosphere so sinister that I must have been too scared to put it into script. Seriously, I know being scared of the dark is normal and all, but you could at least have gotten over it to mention such an effective use of lighting. The following is a wonderful example of how information should be handled in storytelling. The desk behind Kion's is vacant for the entire morning, which is already concerning. Kunikita plops down in the empty seat and mentions that the cold Taniguchi caught has been sweeping the school for a while now. That's odd, we didn't see anything like that yesterday. We then learn that Taniguchi also missed gym class yesterday. Um, the fuck he did. I'll never forget that spectacular kick and that hilariously lackluster follow-up by Kion. Something is now obviously wrong. Thinking back to the title of the film, there's no doubt that Haruhi is gone now. But hold on a second. Kunikita mentioned that she is absent today while looking at the desk behind Kion, so maybe not. Well, suppress any hopes that you had because that she was not referring to Haruhi. It was referring to Little Miss I'm Going to Kill You to see how Miss Suzumiya reacts. Ryoko Asakura is a very traumatizing character for Kion to say the least. She only lived through four episodes in the TV series, but she sure did make an impact. Do you see what's going on here? Every time we receive a new piece of information, it does anything but put us at ease. In order to engage the audience, you need to make every new detail add tension and intrigue to a scene, rather than take it away. And talk about tense. The slow motion walk they have her do is both ridiculously impressive and extremely effective at conveying the dread Kion feels in this scene. On top of all this, she's acting all polite like she did in the first three episodes of the show, and when questioned about Haruhi, she and the rest of the class unanimously answered that they have no idea who she is. Kion's visceral negative reaction to hearing this news is telling to say the least, but there's no time to dwell on what it means for now. He starts burning through his options. Koizumi's class is missing, Mikaru and Suruya have no idea who he is, and all the while, he thinks to himself that if he could just find Nagata she could fix everything. It's also worth mentioning that even in these times of despair, times where Kion finds himself too mentally rattled to even walk correctly, the film still slips in some goofy moments. When Mikaru fails to remember Kion, he thinks of something he can say that only he knows. And in this moment, every single person who saw the show sank into their seats, thinking to themselves, Please God no, don't say it. Fuck don't say it. Please no, don't do it. You don't know what you're doing. I know for a fact you've got a tiny star-shaped mole on your breast right about here. You have to let me see it. <laughs> so, imagine going up to someone you have never met before and then dropping this on their heads. There's also the part where he unironically tells his little sister to leave the room because he needs to have a serious talk with Shamison, aka the cat. And he also has the uncanny ability of almost getting hit by cars in this movie. It's a great way to continue the light bits of humor we saw sprinkled throughout the intro of this film. And no need to worry about tonal dissonance. These are things Kion would have done regardless considering his desperation. I just happened to find them very funny. By the way, in the Mikuru scene, everyone is reflected perfectly onto the floor, something we'll be seeing a lot of because these animators were insane. And Kion's nose turns red from when Saruya shoved her fist in front of his face. Anyways, Kion is making his way to the SOS Brigade club room, his last line of defense. Swinging the door open, he sees exactly who he wanted to see. Nagato, the alien who can fix anything. But of course, she's acting strange too. Stranger than anyone we've seen so far. Her glasses are back, she doesn't remember all the crazy adventures she's had in the SOS Brigade, and she has an actual personality. That last bit is the most concerning of all. This isn't Nagato. That much is clear. There is a lot of love put into this scene. The way this new Nagato unintentionally gives Kion a glimmer of hope before taking it away, causing him to go poo-poo bananas and bake her to fix this situation just like she always does. The way he gives Nagato her chair back when he realizes he sat in it without thinking. It's a good way to affirm that Kion's behavior mere minutes ago was a spur-of-the-moment act fueled by the hopelessness he's feeling, nothing more. The fact that Nagato gives him a club form for the literary club, even though Kion was scary as hell for a second there, hinting that she might have a reason to trust him that we don't know yet. And finally, let's all just appreciate this sound effect real quick. <laughs> 
By the way, that computer is the only thing in this room that wasn't there before the SOS Brigade took over. Keon doesn't find anything useful on it for now, but who knows, it might be important later. Damn it. Why do I have to be the one who's got to look for her, huh? I'm not sure, man. But, you know, have to and want to are two very different things. The next day, Goody Two-Shoes Asakura tries to talk to Kion again. But seeing as how he doesn't even trust her enough to let her reach into her pocket, it's in one ear and out the other. She does say something interesting for us to keep in mind, though. You have to accept the reality that's in front of you. And that'll help you start to understand everything. So how about it, then? Do you think you can do that? She could make donating to orphans with deadly diseases sound sinister. Regardless, the monologue Kion has about whether or not he should be happy or sad with his current predicament was a real highlight for me. I can't tell that to anyone though. They'll uncover my hidden plans to try to replicate his manner of speech just like I did in my first Haruhi video. Oh, shit, that's right, you're all in here too, huh? Well, that that's, uh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> um, cat's out of the bag now. Uh, <clears throat> uh, where was I? I like this shot where Kion flinches as he sees two people rounding this corner because at the beginning of the film, Mikuru and Suruya ran into him in the same spot. After trudging his way back to the literary club to make awkward small talk with Nagato, Kion notices a familiar book on the bookshelf. Opening it up reveals the bookmark the real Nagato used to invite Kion to talk with her in the show. Although this time, it tells him to collect all the keys to get out of here and that he only has two days to do so. They really sell just how happy he is to hear from the savior of the SOS Brigade once again. And it's at this point in the movie where, after 12 rewatches, you begin to notice that every single line of dialogue has a meaningful purpose. Sure, every line in every film ever made is deliberate, but anyone can examine a script with a fine-tooth comb and pick out several lines that should be cut. I personally wouldn't lay a finger on this movie though, and here are a few examples as to why. While Nagato is making conversation with Kion, she may mentions that she borrowed the book she's reading from the city library, foreshadowing the reveal of the one time this Nagato met Kion in the past. Kion's monologues regarding his feelings on these two worlds reveals that even though he's clearly made his decision from the outset, there is something very tempting about this strangely normal universe he's been plunged into. Asakura's lines are laced with warning signs hiding beneath her unflinching smile, and while Kion is staying at Nagato's place that evening, she really turns up the heat. If you decide to go out with Nagato, don't play around with her. Take it seriously, okay? If you don't, I will never forgive you. On December 20th, Kion complains to himself about why Nagato only gave him two days to reset the world, claiming that with her power, she should have been able to give him plenty of time. Perhaps there's a good reason why she can't. I can go on forever, and I guess I will, given how I still intend to point this stuff out as it comes. But I think it's worth mentioning that I could go through all two hours and 44 minutes of this script and explain to you why each line deserves to be here. It's an extremely special quality quality for a film to possess in my eyes. Anyways, today is the deadline. And I suppose the faculty realized how foolish it was to keep the lights off during winter. I wonder why the change. Perhaps because Taniguchi is back in class. <laughs> I might have a future in comedy with lines like that. Well, I'm half right. The information that led to this choice comes from Taniguchi, but it doesn't have anything to do with him. While asking Kion about his fit of insanity the other day, he mentions that he knew Haruhi from middle school. If you've seen the movie, you know how this goes. Kion becomes ecstatic and sprints off after he hears that Haruhi goes to Koyoan Academy in this world. By the way, if you'll remember, this is the second time Taniguchi has mentioned a girl who goes to that school to Kion. However, unlike the first time, now we have credence to give a shit. The piece Suzumiya Haruhi no Tekagari bells into the room, commanding the audience's attention and lifting their spirits after almost an hour of hopelessness. The fully orchestrated score for this film was put together by these wonderful people, the producer among them being Satoru Kosaki, and it was performed by the eminent symphony orchestra. It cannot be understated just how much better this film is because of its soundtrack. It's filled to the brim with the kind of compositions that crawl their way into your brain and force you to feel something. Case in point, the song that's playing right now. I don't know a damn thing about music on a technical level, so forgive me if my terminology sucks, but the way the lower pitched strings build 
build the song up into this cathartic release of Kion's sheer determination is so special. It's accompanied by what I think are woodwind instruments that add this air of childlike wonder to the piece, representing the idea that Haruhi's world full of oddities and whimsy may not be lost forever. As the iconic shot of Kion sprinting past the oncoming train burns itself into your eyes, the song climaxes, bringing together the two instrument groups, only for the crash of some cymbals to keep the momentum going. That was probably all nonsense, and I do apologize to anyone who knows their stuff when it comes to orchestral music, but man, I love this song as much as I love the way it was used in this film. It may not shock you at this point, but yes, I can go on like this for any track in the movie. Anyways, the anxious wait for Koyoin's classes to let out is another great example of this film's superb handling of information. It builds up your anticipation with Kion's monologue, hits you with two of Koizumi's missing classmates walking out the front gate to make both you and Kion think, oh crap, she's really here. And then finally, she walks through the gate. The first thing we see is a shot of her long flowing hair and those yellow ribbons she's always wearing in it. She's definitely Haruhi, but one who bears no relation to Kion. If she did, she would have chopped off all that hair ages ago. You can take this as a good thing though, because the look on her face tells us that she isn't exactly having the time of her life without him. In fact, if you listen to what she's saying here over Kion's monologue, she's basically telling Koizumi what a boring piece of shit he is by saying the book he lent her was excruciatingly uninteresting. I honestly feel bad for the guy whenever I watch this scene. It's here where his standard routine of pleading for someone who has never met him to remember him deviates for the first time. Because unlike everyone else, there is one memory that this horror he shares with Kion. And I really wish I could have been there in the theater opening night with a bunch of horror he fans to witness an audience pop off the Avengers could never touch. Who are you? What's your name? John Smith. That's all it takes to bring Haruhi back on the team. A trump card Kion unknowingly made for himself when he traveled back in time by three years in the TV series. What's your name anyway? It's John Smith. You're such a dork. She wholeheartedly believes his story, that this world used to be different, and the only person alive who knows this is him. And not because it makes any sense whatsoever, but because it would be really cool if he was telling the truth. As Kion breathes a sigh of relief and gets all giddy about how this world's horror he is almost identical to his personality-wise, I often find myself joining him. The way she calls her utter self a complete idiot for not believing Kion's absurd stories. The way she hatches a crazy scheme and immediately assumes the position of leader. Hell, even the way she couldn't care less about changing clothes in public. Nagato's new self is exponentially more expressive and emotional, making her unrecognizable. Koizumi is still shrewd, but he lacks the snake-like tendencies of that charming devil we all know and love. Mikuru is still the same, but it's hard to alter a personality that doesn't exist, so she's out. Haruhi is the only one who stays the same, the only one who understands Kion and believes him, and for so many many reasons that I'll get into soon, I absolutely adore this. Speaking of adoration, Koizumi has the hots for Haruhi in this universe, and he parrots a lot of normal Koizumi's words when he describes her. The implications of these words only become more interesting after you delve into the light novels to learn who he really is. But that's not what we're here to talk about, so we're moving on. As Haruhi drags Kion and Koizumi to North High in order to get everyone from the SOS Brigade together again, the callbacks to the TV series kick into match maximum overdrive. We've got Haruhi referring to getting Mikuru on board as capturing her. She locks the door once everyone is in the club room just like in the show. As I mentioned before, there's a reference to her tendency to change clothes in public. And of course, Kion can't help himself asking her to put her hair up in a ponytail. It really begs the question, why go through the trouble of naturally integrating all these callbacks? We're almost there, trust me. As it turns out, getting the SOS Brigade back together was the key Nagato was talking about. The computer that I mentioned before suddenly turns on and informs us that all Kion has to do to continue his quest to get back to the old world is press enter on the keyboard. His mind made up, he hands Nagato back her club registration form, leading to the saddest facial expression I've ever seen a character make before, dear god that is hard to look at, and she even fails to grab the paper the first time around. Also, I know this is a big, serious moment, but I'm gonna do what I always do and ruin the mood because I think it's funny. So like, 
What if Kion spends all this time non-verbally saying goodbye to this new world just to click the wrong key on the keyboard? Imagine the look on his face realizing that he has to live here for the rest of his life due to a fucking misinput. There was a misinput, misinput, calm down! You calm the fuck down! There was a misinput! But nah, he hits the right key. While he travels, a barrage of quotes from the film begin to play, ending with Asakura saying, I'll never forgive you. I'm sure that's just a coincidence, right guys? Kion is dropped back into the original world three years ago on Tanabata, the day he traveled back to previously in order to help Haruhi paint that weird message and unknowingly tell the lie that saved his ass just a few short hours ago. Since he's here again, that must mean that adult Mikaru is here too, and sure enough, she's been expecting him. She tells him a lot of stuff, like Haruhi wasn't the one who did this, the world itself was changed, meaning we aren't dealing with alternate timelines, and that the Kion he is now is the one who met with middle school school Haruhi the second time. A lot of plot crucial stuff, but screw that. I'm much more interested in the conversation she has with him when they're just killing time before they head to Nagato's apartment. She reminisces on her time in high school by saying this, Miss Suzumiya did whatever she wanted with me. She made me wear all those costumes. It was a lot of trouble at the time, but they're all happy memories now. Kion, you know what? One day you're going to look back on the days you spent as a high school student with nostalgia. This time in your life will be over before you even realize it. It'll all seem like a dream. I've had this line read verbatim to me 12 times, and it took all 12 of them for me to realize how important I think this quote is when examining Disappearance's place in this franchise. I haven't exactly made it a secret that I didn't enjoy Haruhi when I first watched it. It was boring, it was annoying, and never seemed to show me the parts of this world I wanted to see, but Disappearance was a film I knew I adored right after the credits rolled for the first time. I just went along with the idea that Haruhi sucked, but the movie was amazing. Hell, the series might be worth the slog just to get to the movie. But the more I thought about it, the more things changed. I looked back fondly on all the escapades the SOS Brigade got themselves into, and it got to a point where I felt the need to give the show a second chance. To my amazement, I found enjoyment in places I never even considered when I first watched it. The characters were intriguing, none of them ever said what was on their mind, leaving their expertly scripted body language to help me pick up the pieces. The strange phenomena were equally shrouded in mystery. Take for instance this green-haired girl who begs the SOS Brigade to find her boyfriend, the computer club president. Once they find him, Kion learns that the guy doesn't have a girlfriend, and we never see green hair again. What am I even supposed to make of that? And crazy stuff like this was happening all the time. Kyoto Animation's signature charm is overflowing in every episode of the show. The stellar comedic timing, the best facial expressions in the business, and one of the greatest soundtracks to any piece of media, period. It got me. It got me good. I adore this series so much that for the first time in my life, I went out of my way to buy books. Seriously, look at them all. Come on now, the surprise is understandable, but at least pick your jaw up off the floor. Look, I get it. I'm a college student who makes YouTube videos about anime in his spare time. It's a miracle that I even know how to read, let alone want to. But there are two things that really brought me to this show's side, the first of which manifested back during my first time watching. I was already bored with the show by episode 2, but after seeing the crazy shit horror he pulled on the computer club, I hopped back on board. She was the only reason I made it to disappearance. Hell, even in shows that I never came around to, she was still the one saving grace. I thought you would want to be alone with him. Leaving seemed like the polite thing to do, so I left in a hurry. Huh? Sounds kind of stupid. Yes, thank you. Fuck this show. And if you are a fan of Haruhi considering giving this show a look, here's my personal recommendation. Don't. I might as well not even exist at this point. It's crazy to think that even when I was losing my mind while watching the show, I still got excited when she dragged the brigade off to play baseball. I still popped off when she solved the island murder mystery like she was playing Ace Attorney. And I was on my feet clapping along to God knows with everybody else in the crowd until my buzzkill dickhead of a brother told me to sit down and stop making so much noise. No matter how bad I thought the show she was in was, she always led me by the hand through 
through it. Kind of like how she leads John Smith here back to his reality. I was having fun, and I didn't even realize it. You know what got me to make the connection, though? Disappearance. Here's where that second thing I mentioned comes in. Somehow, some way, the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya managed to make me feel the same emotions and go through the exact same journey its main character, Kion, does. This is probably an assertion big enough for an entire video, but I'll give you the Spark Notes version. Kion always had the uncanny ability of monologuing my exact thoughts during key moments, and the show itself always felt like it was reacting to these thoughts. Getting bored with the mundane nature of the first three episodes? Well, so was Asakura, and now she's going to murder the main character because of it. Losing your mind over Haruhi's selfish antics? Well, she's going to make you watch eight of the exact same episode for the stupidest reason I've ever heard. That tears it, right? There's no redeeming this person anymore, is there? Well, guess what, pal? She'll not only make you forgive her for endless age, she'll make you care about her too. All of this leads into disappearance. The countless callbacks. Reminders of the time you spent with this show scattered haphazardly around this bizarre version of it that feels uncomfortably normal. You want to go back to the old world just as much as Kion does, don't you? Of course I do. Even back when I first watched the movie, I wanted to go back. I didn't even know why, and even now, it's a feeling that seems impossible to explain. But regardless, it's a feeling so visceral that I remember it vividly over two years later. And now here I am, picking apart this movie because I want to make a full-fledged video on it. Coming face to face with a line I never paid any mind to that plants the seeds for the massive revelation that both Kion and I had a handful of minutes later. Well, revelation might be too strong of a word. We knew how we felt, we just didn't accept it yet, I guess. It just goes to show that you can always find something new to appreciate when you watch this film. And believe me, anything that adds more value to one of the greatest character-to-audience parallels I've ever experienced is worth its weight in gold. By the way, I talked for so long that Kion and Adult Mikuru are now at Nagato's apartment. Even while Adult Mikuru looked away as Kion demanded to know who changed the world, I had no idea who it could have been. I mean, why would I? This show has taught me that this person is essentially an infallible, and could just use weird alien robot magic to poof any problem away. The funny thing is, I often hear that the quote-unquote villain of this movie is extremely predictable. I guess I'm just dumb then. No, 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 you don't get to tell me, I'll tell myself. But seriously, I had no idea. Not when I saw Kion's shocked expression upon hearing who it was. Not when he and adult Mikuru traveled forward in time to December 18th. And not when the two of them crouched down in front of North High's gate to wait for her. The following monologue made me feel even more stupid for not realizing it sooner. But for now, can we just appreciate the scene where Yuki Nagato changes the world? She raises and moves her hand as horns creep their way into your ears, and everything begins to move, as if she's conducting the clouds, the wind, and the moonlight to make her desires come true. Desires that Kyo never thought she'd ever have. I think I've made it clear that I love every scene in this film, but this next one is my absolute favorite. It's the kind of scene that you could watch out of context and feel compelled to see the original work. Regardless of what I say next, I can't do this scene justice. If you haven't already, I urge you to experience experience it for yourself. It begins with Kion talking about Nagato and the new emotions she's acquired, saying all the error data she wouldn't stop harping on about in her apartment was really just a complication that arose from an emotionless alien learning to feel things. Those subtle changes Koizumi mentioned at the beginning of the film? Yeah, they actually meant something. But then he questions why Nagato gave him the keys to get back to the original world. Even in her fit of world-altering selfishness, she still gave him an out because she trusted him to make the right call. The visual storytelling here is unparalleled. Both worlds are represented by a pivotal piece of paper that belongs to their versions of Nagato, the bookmark and the club registration form. Kion is shown standing at a ticket gate, unable to move forward, as the Nagato of the other world stands behind him and gently tugs on his sleeve. His reflection demands that he come to a decision on which world he prefers, taking him place to place, calling him out on the way he contradicts himself. I mean, really. He does nothing but complain when he's near Haruhi, but he still pressed the enter key without hesitation? Ready? And you answered yes to that question. Isn't that right? 
The second the other Kion says ready, a track by the same name begins to play, and it is without a doubt one of the most moving and powerful songs I have ever heard. I can make myself tear up by just playing it back in my head, let alone actually listening to it. When the other Kion's questions are finished, he demands an answer, stomping Kion's head down on his desk. And here, Kion proudly tells him that it was fun, and he loved every minute of it. In fact, he's offended that he even asked. The other Kion is destroyed, the bookmark comes out of the ticket holder, and the gate opens. The other Nagato lets go, and Kion walks forward, finding himself face to face with the Haruhi he knows. He thinks about the question he was asked, don't you find such an extraordinary school life fun? And sends the scene off in four short words. Of course I do. Alright, I think I need a palate cleanser after that one. How about... murder? Jude, watch out! Huh? What, you didn't forget about her, did you? Before we proceed, try not to grab your side while watching this. The sound design is what really gets me here. It's just one stab wound, but it sounds so gruesome. As Asakura implies, Nagato brought her back to protect the new world from being changed back into the old one, saying, quote, After all, this is what you wished for. I love the part where she launches blood into the new Nagato's face as she watches her little victory dance in horror, each drop frozen in the air, reflecting the face of the person they're looking at. I can't even begin to imagine how much of a nightmare that was to anime. Anyways, you know how it goes. Normal Nagato once again catches Asakura's blade and swiftly deals with her as two Mikarus run to Kion's side and start crying over him. A third person with Kion's voice steps forward, telling him to just rest and not worry because it hurt for him too. Kion closes his eyes and when he opens them again, he's in a hospital on December 21st. It's more messy timeline shenanigans, par for the course for Haruhi. You've got Kion living through something that he already survived because his future self came back to the past to finish the job he failed to complete. How is that possible, you ask? Well, th uh... A theory that is contradictory in itself cannot begin to explain the contradictions inherent within it. Yeah, let's go with that. Anyways, Haruhi has been in a sleeping bag next to Kion's hospital bed for three days waiting for him to wake up and that's adorable. Koizumi is there too so he can repeat the jealous sentiments of his other self and reveal what Haruhi's been up to ever since Kion went into a a coma. That's what happened to Kion in this world after it got changed back to normal. It's been three days since it changed and Kion had to be put out of commission to make up for lost time. This probably doesn't make much sense, but don't worry, you just have to watch the movie 12 times like I have. By the way, you can see Haruhi's sleeping bag off to the side before Koizumi brings it up. Once Haruhi wakes up, she goes into full damage control mode, acting absurd and unreasonable as always. But unlike how Kion usually is, this time he can't can't help but smile at Haruhi's nonsense, as if to say it's good to be home. And given the parallels I've described between myself and him, the sentiment reached me as well. What an amazing conclusion. Haruhi and Kion have a nice exchange before we see her off, but there's still business that needs to be attended to with Nagato, and where else to do it but the roof of the hospital, complete with this gorgeous city skyline. It's here where Kion begins to see Nagato in a different light. After what happened, he can't in good faith look Look at her as this all-seeing, all-knowing super entity anymore. She has feelings, and he needs to treat her like she does. He calls her by her first name, he gives her his coat when it begins to snow, and he apologizes for choosing the old world over the one that she created. We're graced once again by Eric Satie's masterpiece as Yuki's hands reach up to feel the snowflakes falling on them. She tells Kion that her higher-ups are deciding on a punishment for her behavior, and Kion says to tell them to go to hell. He's not about to let anyone lay a finger on one of the SOS Brigade members, and neither is Haruhi. Nagato stole Haruhi's powers and created a world where the data thought entity doesn't exist, an act that's almost poetic in and of itself. So it's already been proven that Haruhi has the power to make these dickheads go bye-bye. And she'd do it too. She'd do anything to keep her Brigade members safe. That's just the kind of person she is. A crazy girl who's as admirable as she is detestable. She'll bring you an absurd amount of 
energy and joy at the cost of any hopes you had of living a normal life, and quite possibly your sanity too. She'll abuse her friends one day and go out on a limb for complete strangers the next. She'll be pushy and bossy while being downright inspirational in the same breath. A complex, fascinating, and endlessly entertaining character. Our annoying, wonderful brigade leader. Once Nagato sends Kion's threat to the higher-ups, she thanks him, bringing this gem of a scene to a close. It's now December 24th. All that's left is for Kion to retrace his steps during the opening scene of the movie, but instead of monologuing about how evil Haru he is, he's reflecting on his choices and getting all excited about the crazy antics Haru he's going to pull during the Christmas party. He thinks to himself that he'll have to go back in time to save his other self from Asakura someday, but hey, it doesn't have to be now, does it? At least wait until after I have some of Haruhi's hot pot cooking, okay? The credits roll, accompanied by Nagato's voice actress singing in silence to remind the audience of the other world they left behind. But before the movie can end on a somber note, we have a post credit scene showing Nagato watching a little kid helping his friend get a library card, much like what Kion did for her all the way back in episode 3. It must have been an important memory, seeing as how it's the only one Kion and the Nagato of the other world shared. Normal Nagato shows us that this is the case by covering her mouth with her book and that just maybe she's hiding a smile. And that's the film. God, I talked for way too long. I am seriously dreading putting this whole thing together. Well, kind of. Look, I can complain all I want, but if this film has taught me anything, it's that something you really enjoy can still cause you immense dread and frustration. <laughs> But seriously, I'm glad that I'm able to do this. To pay tribute to this film and all the wonderful people who made it possible, especially since some of them, including the director, are unfortunately no longer with us. To Yasuhiro Takimoto and his team, thank you. I will never forget the incredible work that you've done. And to everyone watching right now, I love the disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya more than almost any work of fiction out there, and I sincerely hope that this video gave you a good understanding of why I do. Thank you for watching, and special thanks to Silent Secondary and the rest of my wonderful patrons.